in Algeria, no fewer than 15 students were reportedly kidnapped from a school in Gira Mbakuso area of Gada, local government area of Sokoto State. The attack is reported to have taken place at the school premises at about 1 a.m. on Saturday morning. The proprietor of the school, Liman Abubakar, confirmed the incident, saying that one person was shot during the attack with a woman abducted. Earlier in the week, on Thursday morning, at least 287 students were abducted by bandits who stormed government secondary school, Kuriga, in Chikun, local government area of Kaduna State. We are now being joined by security analyst Dr. Kabir Adamo to discuss the worsening insecurity in the country, why the huge spending in the security sector has not stemmed the tide, and why no security chief has resigned or been sacked for not taking responsibility. Thank you so much for joining us on Newsday. Welcome to Arise News. Well, Dr. Kabil, a number of questions, you know, running through my mind. Why are we having a resurgence, you know, of school kidnappings again? Why are, are secure, uh, uh, the government, their response so far, how would you analyze it? I have so many questions, I don't even know where to start. But let's start with why are we having a resurgence and the response by the government? What's your assessment of their response? Um, in simple terms, the reason why we're having a resurgence is because we've not resurgence is because we've not taken a, um, enough corrective measures to prevent a reoccurrence. When the Chibok incident happened in 2014, before then even the Buniyadi incident, um, the reason was very clear. Our schools were vulnerable. And since then, we've had, I would say, three major programs aimed at improving security in schools. The Safe School Initiative, the Safe School Declaration, and then the National Policy on, on Safe Schools and its Implementation Guideline. Now, none of these um, three major policies that I've mentioned have been fully implemented to make schools vulnerable to this type of attacks. Um, so that's number one. Number two is the presence of these perpetrators, the non-state actors, the gunmen, who have found kidnapping students a very lucrative venture, as it were. They are able to do it, and then, of course, co collect uh, the benefit. The third point is our inability to um, take into account or hold responsible those that we have mandated constitutionally to, to protect our schools. There are agencies of government whose responsibility it is to do that. And over time, after incident after incident, we haven't seen them being, uh, you know, taking, um, given that kind of level of responsibility or, uh, or account. So unfortunately, that is why these things continue to, to occur. And there seems to be a very strong correlation between insecurity and these kidnappings of school children and the uh, poverty or worsening uh, situation, the food scarcity, the uh, just the harshness of life that average Nigerians are facing. And with the amount that's being spent on security, I mean, we have a budget that's in the trillions. Um, it seems that it's not trickling down to uh, the individuals who need the artillery and the uh, ammunition in order to fend these uh, situations off. What do you make of the amount of money that is con constantly being spent on security? Yeah, um, so, I mean, when you asked me earlier on, what do I think about their response? Um, frankly, the response has not been very visible. Um, if they're doing something behind the scenes, then I would say we're, we're ho hoping that whatever it is they're doing would be fruitful. But in terms of the requirement to indicate the that they're doing a lot, we haven't seen that. Um, I'm not aware that an emergency center has been set up. I'm not aware that that emergency center is reeling out information to the public. I'm not aware that the family members of these 200 plus kids that are in the hands of the gunmen are, being, are, are receiving any kind of attention um, from the government. So in that regard, I think there are huge questions. And that brings me to your question regarding uh, the budget, budgeting for security. Um, it's uh, very clear that the single sector that receives the highest amount of allocation in the budget over a very long period has been security. But unfortunately, we're not yet seeing the result of, of, of that. Um, and perhaps the reason is um, the level of um, accountability, financial accountability within the sector. Um, the last time the parliament entertained the security sector leadership, the Minister of Finance was there. And from the feedback we got, he was asked if 
they were releasing um, you know, the, the, the budgetary amount to the security agencies, and it appears there are some discrepancies there. Perhaps not all of what, what is being budgeted is actually being released to those, those security agencies. So if that is the case, then um, unfortunately it means um, perhaps that's the beginning of the fault. Monies are voted, but then they are never given to the security agencies. But we also know that, sadly, corruption remains a huge factor within the security agency. So even the little that is given, there is no guarantee that it is going to what, what is expected of. And then the third point is that even if um, everything that is voted in terms of money goes to, goes to the security agencies, um, it, they can't do it alone. Uh, we, we talk of the all of society and the all of government approach to security. I think it's high time we implement that so that every Nigerian feels ca carried along within the security uh, you know, process. Right now, a lot of people feel disenchanted. Um, the level of involvement and commitment of Nigerians, as well as between the federal and state government, is very, very loose. And so going forward, that would be, to me, the most important thing to do, and not necessarily more money um, to be sunk into the security sector. Well, and of course, this, this um, crisis also reignites the debate of whether ransom should be paid or not. You know, the government was quick to remind us some weeks back that ransom is illegal and that Nigerians should not pay ransom to kidnappers. So what then is the fate, you know, of these children that have been kidnapped? Um, you know, my, my very simple, even though controversial, um, position on this matter is that we need to make security justiciable. Um, when we make security justiciable in a manner that if uh, government fails to protect me, then I can go to court and see government as it were, then uh, in that instance I think it would be fair for government to tell me not, not to pay ransom. As, as a security practitioner, I do understand that payment of ransom will incentivize the criminals. Uh, it would make them go after more people so that they can collect the money. But the paradox is there. As long as government, we can't see government to in, in, increase protection, then I don't think it's fair for government to tell us not to pay ransom. The option for these kids is either they are rescued or they are released. And the only way they will be released is if these bad guys get what they want. So if their intention is money, they would have to be paid that money. If they have other intentions, like it's, it happens in other times, maybe some of their members have been arrested and they want them released, then that's another conversation they're going to have with government. But suffice to say, way or the other, once, as long as rescue is not um, an, an option. And in Nigeria, rescue is a very slim option. The percentage of rescue to release um, is almost ne next to, it's just about less than 10% um, of the number of abductees that we've monitored over time who have been rescued compared to the number for whom ransom is paid and then they are eventually released. So the likelihood, if you go by that probability, is that this, um, some form of ransom will have to be paid for these kids to be released. And amidst all these kidnappings, who should be held responsible? There have been no resignations, no outward uh, uh, claims of responsibility. Who should the buck fall on? And would that be a good way to start to see things moving when um, responsibility is being taken uh, from the highest uh, echelons of uh, the security details? So, um, I mean, this is essentially internal security. And if, if we agree that it's essentially internal security, there are, to my mind, two uh, organizations that come to immediately, and that is the police and then the civil defense. If you extend the conversation to say schools fall under critical infrastructure, which is debatable anyway, then it goes to the civil defense. So honestly, as far as I'm concerned, it, it's these two organizations. We can extend it to ask if intelligence was shared before the incident occurred. Now, if it was shared, it means the intelligence organizations such as the DSS would have done their work. But if they did not gather intelligence, I mean, let, let's, let's put this in context. These bad guys moved almost 300 kilometers from somewhere in the Northwest to come to Kaduna to carry out the incident. They were not stopped, they were not prevented and then they were able to carry the students. So clearly, there was a failure of most likely intelligence. So that brings the third level of accountability, the intelligence agencies. And then, of course, once the act has been committed, 
uh, it's left for now the other security organizations. And we know, as an example, the Air Force has done amazingly well. Uh, some of the kids who escaped gave account of how they saw Air Force planes hovering above them, and that forced the abductors to lay, lie low. So if there was a coordination of both air and ground intelligence, perhaps those kids would have been res rescued immediately after the, the incident. So in terms of accountability, the two that come to my mind would be the police and um, the civil defense. Okay, now, some analysts believe that we should have heard, you know, of some military chiefs been sacked over this um of kidnappings. I'm wondering what your thoughts are on this. I know that in previous government we witnessed such where a number of times the military chiefs were relieved of their appointments, but that did not really resolve the issue, did it? Um, so uh, I'm not supportive of the fact that the military should be involved in this matter. It is an internal security issue. Uh, the perpetrators are gunmen who are living in Nigeria, who are operating in Nigeria. And so uh, it's essentially an internal security matter. And it's to that extent that I do not think we should even bring the military into that conversation, except if there is a presidential directive before now that gave the military uh, priority over protection of schools. And I'm not aware that there was anything like that. Um, so the military can support. But honestly, it's not their primary responsibility. The primary responsibility is one of those, the internal security organizations. And so if anyone should be held responsible, it should be those one. I mean, analysts who suggest the military, perhaps it's a uh, legacy of our military past um, that a lot of us see the military as responsible for internal security. But we are practicing a demo democratic system. And the reality is that those internal security organizations are the ones that should be responsible for internal security issues. And so I do not agree that this responsibility is one of the military. Uh, what, do you, what do you make of uh, state police in a situation like this? Is this a situation where more hands on deck would have helped? Or do you share some of the fears that other analysts have that state police might be co-opted for other nefarious uh, reasons rather than combating the crime that is at hand? So um, essentially, uh, it, it's, uh, it, um, I'm of the position that um, Nigeria is probably the only federating unit um, country that does not have a, um, uh, a federal security structure. So I am supportive of the decentralization of security. Uh, both arguments, the argument that says uh, state policing can be hijacked by the governors uh, and the several other components of that argument, the ability to pay uh, state police and all of that, I think they are tenable arguments. But the other argument that also says there is a gap in our current security structure and that we need more um, security deployment in the, in the, at the state and that state police can solve that is also a very tenable argument. And so we are, I would say, in a catch-22 situation where we have to move carefully. Um, we do need the decentralization of um, policing. But before then, I think it's important to define to ourselves what do we even mean by policing. Because, and I say this with all sense of responsibility. I do not think, as a country, we have actually defined um, what we want as policing. Policing is essential around law enforcement. It's essential around the protection of um, lives and, and properties of um, you know, law-abiding Nigerians. Um, we have a situation where we have so many organizations that are carrying out the policing function, but they are not as one. So you have the Nigeria Police Force, you have, um, name them, uh, EFCC to an extent, ICPC, the road safety, uh, in certain instances, the immigration, and then in certain instances, the Nigeria Security and Civil Defense Corps. Uh, in certain instances, even NAVDAC to an extent would be carrying out some of those functions. So the, the, this disaggregated nature of policing within the country is not help, help, helpful. Now, if we go and decentralize police and we leave this uh, disaggregated nature of policing, is that what we we'll do at the state level too? So perhaps starting from that point, what do we want out of um, our policing structure at the moment? And then once we define that, um, of course, a constitutional amendment which is required. Um, I'm also of the opinion that perhaps we need to come up with a checklist, um, a checklist to say each state that meets this criteria that would be allowed to you know, create its own um, policing structure as it were. And then, of course, if at any point in time it fails to meet that criteria, 
um, that license, quote and unquote, can be withdrawn um, from it. So essentially, yes, I'm supportive of it, but there must be so many things that uh, should, could, should be done before we go the state policing way. So in the meantime, what would you say is the way forward, you know, especially in getting those children back home safely? We know there were reports that the Kaduna state government had hired a private negotiator, which was later dismissed. What is the way forward to get the children back and to prevent a recurrence of this type of crisis? Um, in simple terms, accountability, accountability, accountability. The president issued uh, a directive, and that directive was very clear. He said uh, the military and the other security agencies should bring back those kids. Now, that's a statement. I'm hoping that the administrative machinery around the president would have raised um, tasking orders, military directives, and several other instruments that they would have pushed out to the security agencies um, and given them timelines of, say, 10 days, two weeks, where they must produce those kits. And of course, those timelines, key performance indicators will be generated from those timelines, and then they will be measurable. Um, in the absence of that, I, I, I honestly don't see any hope uh, in our ability to move forward. Uh, we are not holding, um, <coughs> as it were, responsible those that we've mandated to implement and to provide, provide security. But perhaps this type of approach, where we use performance measurement, where we use um, monitoring and evaluation systems within the security sector is what we need. Um, the second point is the need for the state governors to get involved. A lot of the responsibility for this actually lies with the state governors. Um, an argument or it, it has a reason, a theory, that perhaps the reason why we're seeing a resurgence of this abduction is because of the creation of vigilantes by several state governments, um, Zamfara, Kata, Sokoto recently did that. And there is a lot of um, discussion out there that uh, the reason why we're seeing that. So I think there is a need for the involvement of both the state and the federal government. Earlier on, I referred to the all of society and then the all of government approach. That's, that's the way to go, using performance ma uh, measurement systems so that uh, any uh, security department, uh, agency or ministry that fails to meet uh, its mandate, we hold them um, responsible. And these mandates are very clear. Uh, all of them, 29 of them, when they were created, they, their mandate was spelled out in the Constitution. So we know what the mandate is, and I, I would call on especially the managers around the presidency to ensure that those mandates are measured. If they are not doing that, then the National Assembly needs to wake up from its slumber and start measuring the performances of these organizations. Um, that rule, especially in the democratic setting, lies between either the executive arm or the, the legislative arm, as, as it were and right now. Um, I'm sorry to say it appears we've accepted failure and we're not um, meting out consequences for, for that failure. And that's unfortunate. Armchair security analysts and other lay people have wondered um, why not follow the money with the BVN and the NIN and everything linking our financial uh, movements, so to speak. And with all these ransoms being paid or the exchange of money between the kidnappers and the families of the victims, there's little that I know of of any reports that uh, show the tra uh, trail of money, which seems to be one of the surest ways to identify and fish out uh, groups of individuals. Why is that that we don't hear any of that happening? Is that happening and is that just information that is held from us as uh, civilians and why has not why isn't more being done on the money trail well i think that the platform for doing that is there and um, perhaps uh, you know behind the scenes that that is being done so as an example we know that um, the, the, the NFIU, the Nigerian Financial Intelligence um, Unit, uh, to an extent the EFCC and then the ICPC, and then of course the Central Bank of Nigeria, the regulator, and maybe even the, the NCC, Nigerian Communications Commission, do have capacity and capability for monitoring um, transactions uh, you know, that, that go through the banking system. And as you know, for some time now, we've been implementing the cashless policy. So the point I'm trying to make is platform for monitoring financial transactions are there. Uh, 
uh, as an individual, if you go to withdraw a certain amount of money, it's being monitored. Um, as a corporate organization, it's being monitored. At least anyone who goes into any banking hall, you see that uh, signage telling you of um, the Anti-Money Laundering Act and its, and its provision. Then, of course, uh, the EFCC also has this um, shkumul. I've forgotten the full meaning of, of shkumul, but and um, every corporate organization is required to sign into it and then, of course, to submit monthly report. And the EFCC has a unit that follows up on that. So that platform does exist. Then at the regional level, ECOWAS has GERBA. GERBA does peer review um, you know, over time, from time to time. And I think the last one, that of Nigeria, was done was um, very recently, actually, and a report was released which showed the gaps that exist within our financial um, reg regulatory system. And those gaps were glaring. And I know that um, since this new government came into place, they've been attempting to uh, close, close up that gap. So as an example, I'm sure you pro recently received um, no notice either from your bank or from your um, um, telephone service provider asking you to come and link your NIN and your, your BVN. Now, all those are attempts to close those gaps, but there are bigger things that need to be done. Um, as an example, um, our banking sector, the gaps that exist in our banking, banking sector are so huge uh, that would allow vulnerabilities to be exploited. Up to 70% of the banking workforce are contract staff, as an example. Um, they, know your cost, they know your customer requirement, how much is it being complied with. There are bank banks that today you can just, all you need is a telephone number, and then you are able to open an account. Um, so there are so many gaps that exist at the moment, but suffice to say the platform does exist, and I know that a lot of effort is being made to actually follow up on, on that. And it, it is um, one of the vulnerabilities that is being exploited by the, the criminals to, co to, to allow them to collect ransom, and then, of course, to also benefit and enjoy the ransom. The earlier we close those gaps, I think the better. And I agree with you totally that um, uh, financial uh, uh, transactions and the regulatory component around it is one key way that we could use to either reduce or to prevent um, this uh, you know, type, type of criminality. Another area, uh, which I must mention quickly, is our inability to cover 100% um, the re, um, national identification um, system. Uh, NIMSI, the last time we were told, uh, only about 100 million Nigerians have been registered under that national identification system. And if you consider the fact that a particular ethnic group, the uh, nomads, the uh, pastoralists, uh, have been fingered as primarily responsible for some of the cr um, crimes that occur in, within the country. And there is no uh, single um, strategy, as it were, to document and to capture them under this national identification system. Then you understand that we have a long way to go. The earlier we cover and the entirety so that we have the 229 million Nigerians registered under NIMSI, the better for us. Once we do that, then the rest is to make sure that uh, we tie that registration to several other companies, including the banking system, name them. And that way we have the ability to monitor, especially using forensic investigation when crime occurs. Right now, that um, ability is um, not as effective as it should be. Security Analyst Dr. Kabira Damu, thank you so much for joining us on Newsday. Mm -hmm.